we're definitely privileged to have with us tonight two remarkable individuals, Maynard Webb and John Donahoe. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here with us tonight. A very brief introduction for our new guests in the audience. Churchill Club is the premier business and technology forum in Silicon Valley, convening unique Silicon Valley conversations for going on 28 years now. And what drives us every day is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through the up to 40 programs that we present each year where like minds can connect with ideas and with each other. We are a member-supported nonprofit organization, and we certainly would welcome you to join and participate as well. Our next program will be held next week on February 11th. It is called Building Trust in 2013 with Richard Edelman, CEO of Edelman, Eric Channing Brown, GM of Integrated Communications at Skype, Jeffrey Pfeffer, well-known author and Stanford professor, and Mary Dent, general counsel at Silicon Valley Bank. And that will be held at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you should find other Twitter codes in your printed programs. I will now introduce our distinguished speakers. John Donahoe is a veteran industry leader who is approaching his fifth anniversary as president and CEO of eBay. Under John's leadership, the company has grown payments, reinvigorated its marketplace business, and established mobile commerce leadership. And aside from the demands of leading and growing this global e-commerce organization and payments company with revenues of over 14 billion last year and hundreds of millions of global users, John's passion is to foster a culture that, that values human connection in an open, honest, and direct way. I think we may hear more about that this evening. And Maynard Webb is chairman of LiveOps, which is a cloud-based call center that he previously led as CEO. Before that, he was COO and a key executive right here at eBay. And through these endeavors and serving on many boards, such as Yahoo and Salesforce.com, and through his own seed investment firm that nurtures entrepreneurs, Maynard has a wealth of knowledge to offer as a mentor and advisor. And this led him to write an acclaimed new book that in its first week became a New York Times bestseller called Rebooting Work, which shares practical insights and takeaways from his vast experience. Tonight, Maynard and John will discuss some of these insights with each other and with you. Please welcome John and Maynard. Thank you. You know, one of the people we share in common who's been an inspiration to both of us is Pierre Omidyar, who is eBay's founder. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about there was used to be the era of the employer and employee, right? As you said, would you call it the patriarchal? Yep. And, and, and now you could say it's the era of empowerment. And Pierre saw this quite early when he created eBay, right? The notion of empowering buyers and sellers, empowering people to connect to one another through trade. We call it connected commerce today. As well, empowering eBay employees, empowering generations. Pierre was not a founder. Many founders stay founders for many, many years, and they have that right to do it, and companies become highly founder-centric. Pierre was almost unique in that he empowered a generation of management while he was still alive. He first empowered Meg and Maynard. Yep. He's now empowered me and our team because he wanted to build a lasting and enduring company. And here's what's interesting, and I think your book picks up on it. Empowerment, that there's a line between empowerment and entitlement, right? In Silicon Valley, we hear a lot about free food and buses with Wi-Fi and and you can quickly trip over the line where you say that your employees are entitled, not empowered. And Pierre always had this way of talking about the accountability that comes with empowerment. How do you empower someone yet hold them accountable to a higher standard? And, and in your book, you talk about be CEO of your own destiny, which I just love. 
as a, as a message to employees. Talk about the, the mindset or what you talk about. How do you build a place where you get your employees to be CEO of their own destiny and be empowered yet not entitled? Yeah, I think that's a really, I love, so entitlement I think is a really bad place anytime that you have it and it's easy to fall into. I remember becoming a, a big executive and thinking, oh, this is gonna be great. And then you get treated better, you get you know, the fly in better classes and you get to do all kinds of things. And you're like, whew, I earned this, this feels pretty cool. But then you start feeling entitled. You know, it's just this yeah. fine line that you have to always watch for entitlement. Uh, I think it's a dangerous, dangerous thing for anybody to start feeling entitled as opposed to being voted onto the team every day and finding a way to be back leading the charge and, and earning uh, a meritocracy kind of uh, mindset. So why I created it, uh, you know, there's a framework in the book um, to help people with where they need to go, but people need to know that it's not, you can't cede control to any company anymore. Meaning you own your attitude, you own your future, and you get to choose which company helps you fulfill that in the best way. But I wanted it to be crystal clear that there was personal accountability for your future, that it wasn't, hey, I showed up, now you take care of me and I'll choose to work here and you better make sure I have a great career and get entertained and all that good stuff. I think that's all cool if you can get entertained. But I really want people, I think there's more in all of us than what we bring to work every day, and I want people to own that. And so that's why I focus a lot on the being the CEO of your own destiny. Whether you work for a company or work for yourself, there's nothing that stops you from getting to where you want to go but you, right? And, and I mean, it's easy to say, hard to do. If you have not all the skill sets you need, well, you know what? <laughs> There's a lot of places to get skill sets today, or there's other things you can do, or maybe you need to change what you want to do, but it, don't feel stuck. Uh, one of the stats that I came across as I was doing this is over half the people in the country today are unhappy. That's criminal. We need to get people fired up. So, I, but it starts with personal accountability for that. I talk about being voted onto the team both as a CEO, I mean, both as an employee and a company. And everybody has choice today. Tomorrow, I think you'll have a chance to have work for many companies potentially at the same time um, and still be able to have a full life as you do that. So I think that personal accountability, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think when you walk into the entitlement stage, either because you aren't happy with where you are or something's bad, it's okay to be unhappy, but it's just not okay to not do something about it. Yeah, and I, we all have the power to do things you know, differently in our lives. You know, as I think about applying some of these principles at eBay today, we have, it, there is a paradigm shift here, right, that Maynard's talking about, where an employee used to show up and say, well, what's my company gonna do for me lately? You know, I want, to be, I want to be mentored, I want to get certain things. Right. And the mindset is, I'm looking up and expecting. And there is the risk of young, talented people today, especially in Silicon Valley, where long-term loyalty is not necessarily in the water, um, walking and saying, what have you done for me lately? And I think it is, a, it is a leadership necessity to, from the beginning, turn that on its head and to, to, to compel young people. I, I say to our young people all the time, you know, there is nobody in the world that cares more about your career than you. Than you. Exactly. Right? And you know, don't wait for someone else to give you coaching. Don't wait for someone else to give you assignments. Don't wait for someone else to, and, and, and the, 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 the second piece that comes with it that's so, I think, is, there is so much focus sometimes on skill and not enough focus on learning. And in a world where it is changing so fast to tell your people, your employees, that what you, part of what you're really looking for is how fast can they learn? And it is their responsibility to 
learn. It's not my responsibility to teach. It's your responsibility to consume learning out of our environment. And a very similar, when you use the words, um, you use the words uh, CEO of your own destiny, yep. but that mindset totally. of, of creating that sense of accountability and expectation of your workforce, of your people, is I think a real important component of building an enduring company in Silicon Valley today. And, th and outside th of Silicon Valley, no doubt as well. Well, I think it's a competitive differentiator. I think the companies are the future. So we talk about the 1% and the rest of the world in the US, and hopefully we don't have all this division for a long period of time. But I think the same thing's gonna happen with talent. I think there's, first of all, there's not enough talent. Everybody, how many here have companies that have openings that you can't fill right now? All right, you, the rest of you can raise your hands pretty soon because you, you have it too. And yet we have unemployment. We are, we need to build more of an ecosystem for leadership in the entire industry, you know, both in techni technical leadership and executive leadership. We, um, we need to make sure we teach people how to be sponges. You know, a lot of people look for the mentor. They come in and they say, you, you and I were chatting about this earlier today. And, you know, when, I, when John first got out of college, he said he was looking for that one person that was gonna answer everything. And then he quickly realized there was no one person that could answer everything. And I came in um, to the world of work with zero pedigree, and, but I was a sponge. And I went out and learned everything I could learn from everybody, whether they worked underneath me, side, they were somebody that was visionary. And I just kept learning and growing and you know evolving. Um, and there were skills along the way that I didn't realize that were so important that I think are gonna be even more important in the future. You mentioned honest, open, and direct. I think trust. You know, the more trusted you are, we, you know, and you don't get trust just because you have a title or a position. You get trust because it's earned and you do what you say and say what you do, and you do it for the right purposes. But when you have that level of trust, you can then get people, you know, more honest with people about what they need to do and they take that to heart. So anyway, I just think um, in the future, you're gonna be way more on your own than you might ever have thought. That's why, you know, we think of mentoring networks out there being so important. And you're gonna need to be way better at learning than you've ever had to be before. Um, but I think it's exciting. I mean, you're gonna be way more empowered. And by the way, just to come back to the, the first point is the top companies are gonna have people scrambling to get at them. We already see that today. I also would say that the cool companies stay cool a lot less than they used to. You know, IBM was a cool, still a cool place, I hope, for some people. But I know there, that I just had 10 books bought by IBM, so I love IBM, and I started there. Um, well, I can get in a lot of trouble here very quickly. But, but it, you know, when it was the coolest, hottest thing on the planet, it had probably a 20 or 30 year lifespan. I, during my time at eBay, we were the coolest thing in the valley. I remember um, making a mistake in applying an ad when the valley was in deep trouble in 01 or 02 for an open house for jobs. We shut the freeways down because we forgot to say technical. And everybody in the valley came looking for jobs. It was awesome. Um, so we were the hottest. Then you got Google to be the hottest. And then there's Facebook. And you know, eBay, thank God, has stayed hot all along. But they stay hot less time. Everything is amping up and speeding up. And so the, uh, and now it's the coolest thing is to go start your own company, which is, I work with entrepreneurs. I think that's all cool. The problem is most startups fail, and then when they don't, they get big, and then you're back to where you started. So, um, but I do think that it's gonna be an incredible competitive advantage to be able to be a talent magnet, to be able to be a place that people learn and grow and get challenged, and that the, that the companies that realize that and don't think about the fact that they own their employees but that they actually do have to have the employees select them every day will have a true advantage for a long time. 
because there isn't enough talent out there and it's going to want to go to the best places. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I want to come back to something you just said, but the, the, the uh, personal opinion. Um, becoming a hot company breeds the si seeds of, of um, unhealthiness. And certainly the eBay that I came to had some very unhealthy elements to it. It had fallen in love with being hot. It had fallen in love with its press clippings. It had fallen in love with the adoration of Wall Street. The culture had stopped focusing on customers and stopped and, and was focusing on being hot. And I would argue that any hot company, that that can happen. And that's why hot companies, that's why in Silicon Valley, it's an interesting thing if you think about it. In the last 50 years, I would argue 90, 95% of the best technology innovations, the best startups, the best entrepreneurs have come out of Silicon Valley, right? It's, this is no place else that have been able to match this. In the last 50 years, that same time period, there have been five scale sustainable companies that have come out of Silicon Valley, five. Now my definition is they've sustained more than 20 years, and they've scaled above $20 billion in market cap. HP, created in the 60s, Intel, early 70s, Apple, and Oracle, late 70s, and Cisco. And then you go all the way to Google, eBay, Yahoo. And I would argue no web company is 20 years old yet, and no web company has earned the right to be an enduring company yet, right? There's an awful lot of web companies that have stratospheric ups you can build a global brand and a global customer base fast. Five years, you can become a global phenom. But you look at the history, Netscape, gone. Um, some of the other... Some, Even this Sun. Is, I mean, Sun, who had a great run for a long time, right. gone. And, and, and so this notion of how do you build enduring characteristics into the company, into the culture. And I think it starts with some of what we're talking about today. If I look at... What were the things that drove eBay's success in the last five years, our reinvention, right? The phase two. The articles are going to talk a lot about the strategic choices, but I would argue the cultural changes are as important. And I would argue that, you know, it's interesting, the, um, the, everything's so new here. I read this wonderful article, uh, this editorial last weekend in the paper called Lincoln School of Management, right? And Lincoln, right, is a hot phenom now, right? The movie and, 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 you know. And it talked about the things that President Lincoln exhibited a couple hundred years ago as management lessons for today. The ability to confront and overcome adversity. Resilience. Thoughtful listening. The capacity to listen to all different points of view and then form a perspective. The emotional intelligence to stay committed to a broader purpose and yet have to make practical choices on the ground. At times, practical choices that seem inconsistent with that purpose. Right. I would argue those are the things that build character. Those are the things that build enduring companies. Those are the things that build great enduring companies over time. And they apply as much today in Silicon Valley as they do. And I, I would look at my eBay colleagues in the audience and say, I think our company has built character over the last five years. And you build character when the whole world writes you off. When it's, when, you know what? When it's tough, when it looks bleak, when you're confronting adversity. And that's when a culture begins to come together. And that's, that's an opportunity, I think, for any company, any business. It's in the good times. I'm, I am more anxious today that we're having good times than I was four years ago when we were going through tough times. Because the good times, that's when people can take their eye off the ball. It's the tough times that people come together as a team and begin to practice these things. And so I think this notion in, 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 in the ethos of, of hot versus great, there is a difference between being hot and, and being great. Great companies have hot periods, but a lot of hot companies never become great. And, and we share, Piero Midier wanted this company to be great. From the beginning. From the I mean, we talked during my time here about having a place where our grandkids would be proud that we were here and that we helped build. Uh, why do you, I'd like to ask you a question. 
It's fascinating to me when I study, uh, so the hot and not hot, I always find interesting. I'm a contrarian. You and I have never been hot, that's for no, damn no, sure, no, right? No, no, no I, you probably were hot, but uh, <laughs> uh, not me. Yeah. So when I, like, even when I came to eBay, people told me I was an idiot, and I just thought it was a cool problem to solve, and I love proving people wrong. Um, I often run when, when something's really, really hot. By the time it gets popular and hot, it's kind of late. Yeah. And then when everybody writes somebody off or they say it's uncool, that's probably a good time to join and there's good economics with turning that around. But why is it in, that we have so few companies that have been able to get to 500, you know, I think there's five or six in the history of the U.S. that have made, you know, half a trillion dollars in market cap. Apple was the last one to break that. And none of them can stay up there. Why do you, what, what goes on there? Well, I think sustaining, I think it's sustaining performance over time is, is challenging, right? It's challenging in any industry. It's certainly challenging in technology where disruption and innovation is happening constantly. But that, 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 that capacity to change and continuous change, change yeah. and to embrace change before it happens to you. Now, the, you know, it's a trite saying, but it's so true. How do you cannibalize yourself before someone else cannibalizes you? And it's an unnatural act when things are going well right. to challenge yourself to do it better, to do it differently. Because every, every instinct in the world says, I want to just keep doing what we're doing because it looks like it's working. And so, so uh, you know, I, I think that, that vibrance, it's something you practice so well, right? When, when things are going well, the leader's got to be tougher. Yep. And when things are tough, that's when the leaders got to hold, hold up and be supportive of, of an organization. And, and I don't know, I, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's hard to sustain performance over time. And in a strange way, you only get better when you have those ups and downs. Well, everybody has ups and downs. Yeah. Well, it's we, true in, in personal in, life, In your right? life, you right. have body blows. I mean, the funny part is you learn in the hard parts. How many people here think of, think of the greatest periods of learning in your professional life? Right. For how many of you was it during a tough period, a period where your company or yourself? Right. Think in your personal life. Think of the periods of time where the greatest personal growth came. For how many of you was it during a period of crisis, challenge, adversity of you, your family, someone you loved? I mean, I know for me, all those. And, and that's the perverse thing in life. We all, we all chase after the good times. And yet it's the challenging times where we really learn. And, and, and so I, I think that, that the blend of, of both. Let me, let me come back to something else that, that, right. that's related, I think, to this mentoring, something you care enormously about. And this is one of the best mentors. I had the opportunity and the privilege of being mentored by Maynard when I first joined eBay. And vice versa, John. Well, you, you were a great help to me. Well, you were my boss, so I was being... No, that <laughs> Let's be clear. I was never clear about that, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, but you were, you were an extraordinary mentor. And, and talk to us a little bit about how you think about mentoring, how you practice mentoring, how, what, how, you know, yeah, well, I think, to go back to what I said a few minutes ago, there's not enough talent in the ecosystem, period. And so it's our obligation when you have the opportunity to work with somebody to do everything you can, can to make them as great as they can be mm -hmm. and make sure that they know that the only limiter to where they're going to go is themselves. And I always tried to be first and foremost, trustworthy, you know, uh, because if you're not trustworthy and somebody has to worry about what your motives or what's in it for, you know, why is he doing this or why is he being nice and why is he asking these questions and then he's going to go take something I said and use it against me, you're not going to have really good relationships. And so I just felt a, a, almost a moral obligation, as I still do, to help people. Um, because I was helped, and I had people willing to invest in me way when I had no reason for anybody to invest in me. And so I'm just trying to help people every day along their path and their journey. And, but I think as you start it with trust, then you ask questions. And you try to make sure, first of all, I always wanted to know if the person was open to advice. 
And uh, because if they weren't, I really didn't want to open up and waste cycles with somebody that didn't want it. And John, you, you were open to it. I was open to it. Uh, you know, I'll go uh, when I when we first um, at eBay, Meg assigned me to help on the culture, and said, "Okay, so fix it." That was awesome. Whatever, and we did a ton of stuff, and you're doing a lot more on that today. But one of the things I felt I could do was talk to people about my lessons learned, um, and because I came up the hard way, and I found a lot of people that shut doors on me everywhere along the way, and I found a way to break through. And I said, you know, I used to be really embarrassed about it, and now I'm pretty proud about it because it worked, you know, somehow. And I, that's, it's not where you started from, it's where you go. And uh, I told Meg that I would never talk to anybody publicly about this, but if she could get a small group together, that I'd be glad to share my story. But I'd only do that if everybody volunteered to come, because I didn't want to do it to anybody that didn't want to hear it, because I was going to bear all the things I was nervous about, right? And so we had that special rule. I went to, um, I, I, I went to Europe first, and Doug um, in Europe hosted me, and it went OK. It went well. So I had to do a couple more. And finally, Meg said to me, Maynard, you're doing this for all 600 directors and above at the time. I'm like, I am not doing it for all 600 directors and above. And, but you know, with Meg, when she says, you're going to do it, generally you <laughs> end up doing it. So we did, and it worked. But out of that, I learned that I can help more people. And by the way, that whole thing was the genesis for what's now a book. So I went from this wicked introvert that wouldn't talk to anybody to some, and, and was thrilled coaching one-on-one -on -one with people to now trying to share some of the same stuff in a different, uh, in a different venue for the whole world in a book. Um, I think you have to just care about people. And it drives me crazy to not have people more productive and more fulfilled and, and I do think we're in a different era, and it's more self-deterministic than ever. And, you know, all the rules that we talked about, even more so, but it's our, all of our obligation, every person's obligation to get coached and to learn from everybody you see, everything you see that you like, think about it. Think about what was the positive you saw, everything you don't like, think about how to make sure you don't do that. <laughs> with your people or, and, you know, as you grow. Um, and, and then I think you owe it to people to give them help. And you can mentor people and coach people whatever stage you are in your career. I've always learned a ton from folks that worked for me, you know, because they had skills and insights that I didn't have. And so as long as you're open to learning and growing, you're going to get a chance to help people a lot more and they'll help you. I mean, I'll, so just what the phase Maynard's talking about, it was literally called a conversation on a park bench with Maynard. And we have a couple benches. Maynard's famous in our company. Those talks were, they were now seven, eight, nine years ago, and they're still there. And so if I were to play back what I hear you talking about, if you, you, you're world class at mentoring, but it's really easy for someone in the audience here to think, well, He's good at mentoring, I'm not good at mentoring, but what are you talking about? You establish trust. You, you ask questions, and you used, to, you, you used questions to pull stuff out of me. You showed your own vulnerability, your own vulnerability that you were willing to learn, you were willing to share, which made it safe for me yep. to then expose my vulnerabilities or my anxieties. Um, and then let me ask, and, and, and by the way, I think those principles apply for, for any of us, right? Being a good mentor. You know, you think about being a good mentor, it's like I'm going to give a lot of advice. Actually, I think you gave me very little advice. You asked hard questions yep. that pulled stuff out of me. You shared from your own experience. And then the you last... Came, you came often to what you wanted to do, but it was a conversation. You led me, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah. it was and, and you... you and I think that there's so much, right, leadership, the, the paradigm of leadership is almost the opposite of what we're talking about, right? It's you're out front, you're bold, you're, you're giving direction, you're 
giving advice. You were always in charge and in control. Yeah. And, and in, in reality, inside, inside a mentoring relationship, and I would argue more visibly that actually sharing your story, sharing of yourself, being open and approachable and vulnerable can often be more inspiring to people than the opposite. Yep, I, I totally agree. I'd love, you know, I learned a can lot I, of Can that. I ask one other thing Absolutely. to work this into your comment? Sure. And you, yet you had a capacity to give direct, honest feedback as well as anyone I've worked with. You were a truth teller, right? And anyone, anyone here get a, have these one-on-ones with it, Maynard? Anyone else from eBay remember these here? I guess Baresi was here. To, yeah, so, right? He, he had the way of telling you the truth, where you needed to get better, where you needed to, your performance wasn't quite up to where it needed to be. And how could you do that? You, you, you combined both. Well, there's a difference in who the person is and how they're performing. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to make sure that everybody knew I was rooting for them, but that I also had high expectations. I think it probably comes from my mom because she had unbelievably high expectations for me. Um, but she was always rooting for me, but she expected the best. And so once you have built the trust and once they know you have their back, you can actually free yourself up to have more direct conversation. And you're not helping them by not having them, right? Think about it as in terms of a diet, right? I have often struggled with weight over my career. Nobody walks up and says, yo, Maynard, you need to lose weight, right? Because that's an uncomfortable place. Or <laughs> you're starting to put on the beef there, Maynard. How about cutting some, <laughs> some stuff? Yet you start losing weight, and you're already dialed in. Yeah. And it starts dropping off. Everybody, oh, hey, man, I noticed you look great. It's like, yeah, where were you when I needed you over here? <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, I think it's often easy to give praise. And by the way, we don't do that enough, and we need to do it way more often. The whole idea of a review in a, in a year is kind of crazy, mm -hmm. right? You need to give valid, people get feedback a million times a day on their mobile phone today and through Facebook. Just think how dated it looks to say, oh, I'm gonna give you an annual review. <laughs> One time a year, what the hell did I do in a year? I did a lot, uh, you know, and it's only coming from me, your boss, you know. So that's a, 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 an outdated concept that needs to get changed pretty dramatically. But, um, you know, I also think if you're, giving people validation, if you're rewarding them and inspiring them most of the day, you can't just give them good news. You also owe them direct feedback on what to do to get better. Because if you don't do that, you're not helping them on their path. You make them feel good if you just give them all good news, but they're not growing. I think it's really tied to coaching and mentoring. I'm a pretty driven guy. I have a personal trainer. And I, th I swear, it drives me nuts. I do the rower uh, with him there, and I always score better. He does nothing. He stands there, you know, and, and yet. Tall, skinny guy, huh? Yeah, it tall, skinny thing. guy, yeah. And if I do it, and I'm pretty driven, I work hard, I never hit the same numbers. A coach is a really good thing, you know, somebody that's outside looking to try to help you along. And so I think just separating out things that they need to work on from this is going to, your career is over if you don't do this and, you know, I can fire you. And I, I always was, you know, and we had to let people go from time to time, but I was always rooting for the person to be successful. And I think they felt that or tried to make sure they felt that. And I, just to echo it, I think if we talk about the topic of, of mentoring and, and, and creating followership, there's a lot about leadership, but the harder challenge is how do you create followership? just reinforcing what Maynard just said, is, is communicating, I want you to win. I really want you to win. And I value who you are. Now, I may talk about where you can get better or how your performance was. Right. But if you didn't perform well, you're not a bad person. Or if you need to get a very much better here, it's not because I think less of you. And, and holding that, that, that paradigm, that challenge, or that balance, I should say, is one of the most important things to do in mentoring and in, in I would argue, in leading. Um, is um, well, my, my father said to me once, he said, um, you know, John, um, I've noticed that um, 
people that I communicate that I believe in them, I get more out of, and they give me more, and they're more loyal. And I think, I think that perhaps an, under, an undervalued tool of leadership, and you got, it's got to be authentic. You are always unbelievably authentic. I try to be authentic. Uh, yeah. Do you believe in what it is we're trying to accomplish, and do you believe in the people? You can be very demanding about performance. You can be very tough on your feedback, but never to confuse the two. And, and so I think that's, a, that's a, a lesson that you tease out nicely in the book, and I think it's a, a, a lesson of leadership that probably fits in that Lincoln category of, of school management. Well, and I think it's servant leadership, and I'd love to ask you a question about how you see, you know, I always am a little late to the game. So by the time I was a top exec, it was uncool to have all the privileges and, you know, the hierarchy <laughs> and all the things. I had to be a servant. Well, damn, I was a servant down here, you know? So, uh, uh, so the days of the imperial CEO, so how have you seen CEO leadership? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be, you know, snarky on that, but it, it does feel that way, you know? Um, you know, how have you Too seen bad. CEO, exactly, wouldn't that be just nice? Everybody kissing your ring and all yeah, that. Right. Didn't <laughs> really happen that way when yeah. I got there. So what, what have you seen change from the imperial yeah. CEO that comes in and he's the boss and I get to do everything to the enlightened view of where CEOs are today and where are they going to go? Well, I'll just be, in my own personal case, um, I grew up inside of a partnership. I grew up inside of Bain, right? A partnership. And my mentor was Tom Tierney, who's now eBay's lead independent director and a man you know well and one of the... And he used to talk about servant leadership. And, and he, 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 would, he would describe it as follows. He says, you know, most, most companies have pyramids and the CEO is on top, right? And he said, John, the way I think about things is it's, it's the opposite. It's an inverted pyramid. And our clients, our customers, they're on the top of the org chart. And the people who are directly touching our customers, facing our customers, they're at the top of our internal org chart. And everyone else in the company exists to help the people who are touching the customers be more effective at serving our customers. And I, as a CEO, I'm on the bottom. And my whole job is to open up channels to make sure we're as effective as possible in our organization to serve those customers. Servant leadership. Pierre embodies servant leadership. Service to our community. And, and ironically, Tom ended up working closely with Jim Collins on the notion of level five leadership. Yep. And, and, and in a partnership, it was the only way to lead. It was, I mean, we have several people here from Accenture and, and, and other, right? In a partnership, which is still a quasi-partnership, you, you don't get empowered from your partners by telling them what to do, right? You don't, and that's true in companies. You don't tell talented people what to do. You pull it out of them. That notion of servant leadership, I think, is a, is a powerful, powerful notion that I certainly learned from Tom. And I think Pierre, it's why I joined eBay. I mean, Pierre just exuded that sense of, again, empowerment and, 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 and service to. Um, and I think ultimately employees want to serve a broader purpose. A higher purpose. A higher purpose, a higher mission. They want to be part of an organization of which they're proud. Not only what you're doing, but who you are. So we have time to hit two more topics, and I want to, I want to hit one of those, which is the role of purpose, values, and behaviors. eBay had them strong in the beginning. We've just relaunched re them, gone out, and and um, I'm sure many of the organizations here, you talk about purpose, values, and behaviors. How do you make them not just be words on a wall? How, how do you make them become real in an organization? You know, um, in my opinion, every company has a purpose, values, and behaviors that sometimes they're just not written and sometimes they're dramatically different than what is written. So there already is a purpose in every company. The question is, is it codified and is it codified correctly? One of the things that we worked really hard on from the beginning before I was here with eBay is how are we going to behave and how are we going to work with our customers? We then took a, another rev of that during my time 
Um, they're coming off the wall over here pretty soon, I understand, as we do the new ones. Um, and, and, and you have just done a redo on those based on where we are now, which is fabulous. I think the most important thing, though, is if you're doing it to do the exercise to then put it on the wall and you don't live it, it doesn't matter. It's got to be heartfelt. I mean, it's got to be something that you hire people that believe those values and that are willing to be held accountable to those values. And you have to live them. And you can't not live them if you want it to work. And so um, I get asked this all the time in some of the startups. Well, what culture do you want to have? Do we want to do this or I'll go pick this? Say, Start with what do you believe in? And what kind of place do you want it to be? And what matters most? So I think it's essential to have in a company I think it exists in every company, but if it's not managed actively, it may not be the values and behaviors you want it to be. Um, but you have to declare what you want it to be. And then it can't be just declare. It has to be, you know, do it every day. Just do what you say, say what you do. Yeah, have to walk the talk. Well, look, our, our conversation has been, you know, a lot around, this is what I think is so great about Maynard's book, in, a, in an era where there's so much focus and attention on innovation, on, on disruption, on some of the exciting things that are so important. You can't, in a technology company, you can't live without that. That is right. the lifeblood. Totally. And yet some of the timeless principles we've been talking about here tonight and Maynard writes so beautifully about in his book, they still apply. They still apply and, and wow, what a powerful combination if your company can combine both. If you can be uh, tremendously innovative and apply those principles. I actually think they're related over time, is the ability to do it. But we've used up most of our talk time. Now it's our chance to hear from you. And we'd welcome your questions, your thoughts, observations, ideas, your feedback if you disagree or have other thoughts. So why don't we open it up, raise your hand, just maybe say who you are, your name, where you're from, and. Hi, uh, my name's David. I uh, actually grew up here in San Jose. And, um, Appreciate the comments tonight. You think that 30 years ago, when the execs of IBM, for example, sat around, would they have the same kind of conversation that you're having now, or is your view on management shifted? I was in IBM 30 years ago. <laughs> and I wasn't born then. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> I was in diapers, but I was working hard. Um, I can tell you exactly, IBM, uh, it was a very paternalistic company. And I loved it. I was there for 12 years. They took a kid and gave me opportunities that I never should have had. But they felt like you were family and you were expected to be, that they were the best place for you to be. And it was like, we own you, right? And they did. They said, IBM used to stand for I've been moved, right? Because it was always company first and it was always about making sure that happened. And if we thought it was right for you and there was an opening, you moved your family and they took really good care of you while they did that. When your kid was born, I have four kids. My first three, I was with IBM. I had a silver spoon sent home to, with their names on it, right? We had a little kind of crazy practices like people could tell how big your title was by the size of your office. And we had crazy folks counting ceiling tiles to make sure they got the right space in their office. And I knew I had made it when I got my wood desk because, you know, I had a metal desk and then when I got a wood desk, man, that was awesome. So uh, I would say that they trained a lot of the management principles we talked about of setting objectives, holding people accountable, coaching one-on-one. -on -one. They did a marvelous job at, but they were looking at it from a lens, and I think it's evolved and changed a lot. I'm not in IBM anymore, but um, it was just a different era. There were no layoffs. They had not, you know, the first, you know, I, I was in Boca Raton in manufacturing, and they shut down manufacturing, and that's when I left the company because they didn't want to lay off manufacturing people. They offered them all a chance to train to become salespeople or programmers. You don't, how often do you see that happen today? <laughs> so I think it was, there are elements of how you treat people and how you, you, you know, handle them that are very similar. 
but, the, but it was from a view that you were always with us. And if somebody left, you know, you were like the enemy, that how could they have left us, you know? And if you went to work for a competitor, you walked, got walked out that door the, that, that day. So I think it's some of the same things, but wickedly different with the whole way we did it. Because we felt strongly, I was a manager and a middle manager there, that we knew best and, you know, you should follow. And there was a lot more, uh, I don't know, I was, as I said, I was much more of a servant. And I can remember waiting for hours on a little couch for when my boss's boss would break from a meeting so that we could run in with our little one-page fact sheet so we could get a decision done, you know. I don't see that happening around the CEO well, office well, quite as much. I'll contrast that. I, I think IBM's a great enduring company. Let's just pick on it today. <clears throat> 18 months ago, I spent a bunch of time with Sam Palmasano, who was the, I, the CEO of IBM. He had just led an update of the shared purpose of IBM that led to the concept Smarter Planet. And the way they went about it is IBM has 350,000 employees, roughly, and they did something called an innovation jam. They engaged 350,000 people in the articulation and creation of their shared purpose, the articulation of the core values, and, and the articulation of the behaviors they needed to exhibit. And it was just a, and what a wonderful example of what was probably the penultimate paternalistic oh. company, using your definition. Yep. And, and now, a, a company that's innovating at scale, that it's, it's, it's and engaging their people in, in very different ways. So, a wonderful example of, of, of the, the, the dynamic nature of, I think, staying great. Thanks for the question. Why don't we go here, and then we'll go there next. And so, um, oops, oh, did you have a mic? I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. So you've so, been trumped. You know, I don't know if you know that. That's what that's yeah, called. So I'm, you've been I'm sorry. You, the, the power of the the power of the megaphone. <laughs> Funny enough, my name is Meg. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, so I'm people new... like Meg do well around here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully so. Oh, I'm scared now. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I have two pieces of practical questions for hiring people and employees, and specifically how it relates to Maynard's point concerning talent and vision. So those are three dots I'm hoping to connect in this question. And if I don't, somebody else will pick it up, I'm sure. Um, so the first thing is, I'm new to California. Hello, everyone. I moved out here for the startup that went belly up, and now I'm looking for a job. So yes, I'm looking for a job. But more specifically, so talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but more specifically, um, I want to talk about the question of talent consolidation, philosophical alignment, and what I call experiential arbitrage that happens in a dynamic marketplace, and how you bring people with many different experiential and intellectual assets to galvanize and focus those assets in one way. And we're not talking about recruiters and job boards. We're talking about how does that conversation occur between folks like yourselves and myself and folks like um, Diane, who's sitting here, and her client. How do you get that conversation going in a relevant, meaningful, sincere, authentic, and transparent way? So that's my question. Did I leave anything out, anybody? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank next, you, John. Thank next you, question. <laughs> no, actually, I was, I was, that is a perfect question for Maynard to answer. Yeah. You know, um, thank you, John. The, the, the first thing that I'd say is when you're looking to join a company or where you're looking to hire somebody, I, I think you have to spend time really treating people that come to, to interview with you well. And a lot of companies kind of outsource that and think the HR people should do that. And, I am a believer that, so you have your, you know, the different behaviors and the values. I think when you see eight or nine people over the course of the day, every person that interviews you should be assigned one of those v values or behaviors so that they can see how they felt you were going to do. And I think companies need to really get trained on how to interview people well, how to get to the bottom of, is this, some people interview really well, <laughs> and don't turn out to do as good a job as what they do on the interview. And some people that are really fabulous, you know, don't do as well in the interview. And so 
There's all kinds of things that are done that are crazy out there, like special tests or special quizzes or putting people on the spot. I think, I think what you've done in the past is a good predictor of what you're going to do in the future. And I always try to find one of the questions I ask people is, oh, so go, you might as well tell me now, because six months from now, I'll know exactly the answer to this question. I'm going to remember what you told me. So what are the people going to say that you do well? And that's easy. Everybody's like, oh, I'm going to do this, this, and this. But why don't you tell me now what are people going to say they really wish you would do better? And I ask that just to see how honest and open they are. And, and I, I, it's amazing the number of times I've gotten, you'll never have any complaints. And I'm like, <laughs> I have yet to find somebody that I work with that there isn't a complaint about. Yeah. So I just think that from, a, from an employer, we have to do a good job to treat people with dignity and respect all the way through the process to know, remember how hard it is to find a job and to get back with them quickly. You know, there's a million things you can do to make it easier on the person and have them like you, even if you decide no. I do the same thing in my investment firm. It's hard to be an, an entrepreneur. Everybody we see, we t treat with the utmost respect and cheer them on, even if we decide not to invest. As a person interviewing, be genuine. Ask thoughtful questions. Don't walk in, you know, there's no reason to not know so much about the company today. Everything's available on the web. Go check on LinkedIn who you're interviewing with, what they're, you know, do some homework, show some care for what you're trying to do and be willing um, to take, you know, I, I joined IBM in the beginning and a job that I wasn't thrilled with because it was a great, it was and is a great company. I hope John did a far better job of giving you love, I'm sorry. I would not be where I am today without help from you guys, so I love you. Um, but I took a job that I didn't get to brag about, you know, even though I had a college degree to get started, because I wanted to join a great company that was a learning company, and then I had new jobs every year. So be willing, you know, be, be sincere in what you're looking for and clear and, you know, go in and be honest and open, and if, if they ask you what, your weaknesses are, tell them. You know, they're, they're not going to run away from that. They just want to know that you're going to be honest about the things you have to work on. Amen. Would you, where would you add to all that? Good I stuff? think he answered Meg's question very well. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. Next. Uh, I'm Linda Turk from Silicon Valley. And maybe Valley we get a, a phone up or a mic up here for next. Uh, my question has to do with uh, Wall Street's relationship with companies and um, what we saw in the 80s was uh, they started rewarding um, companies that had layoffs, whether they needed them or not. And, and that's when I think employee loyalty and the whole relationship changed. Mm -hmm. Now that 70% of our markets are run by high frequency trading and uh, the market is so fickle, how does that affect, let's say, a medium-sized company in, in being able to be the employer of choice because they sure seem to be just wanting the menu. They don't want sponges. They're not interested in sponge material at all. You know, I think there's, uh, you've got to build the company for the long term. There's just no example of short termness really paying off, I think. And so that starts with how you, how you dialogue with your employees. That, starts with the, their commitment to the company. What, are you tying them to the stock price? Right? The eBay people in here know I never talk about our stock price. I don't look at our stock price most days. There was a long period of time I didn't look as it was depressing. <laughs> and, you know, stock prices don't move steadily. And, and so I think, I think part of the job of leadership is to orient around what is our purpose? What are we building for the longer term? What are our customers saying about us? By the way, if customers are saying good things, usually the financials kind of follow those, and usually the stock price over some period of time. And yeah, there are painful periods of layoffs, and, 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 and yeah, there's a lot of short-term pressure, and, and you know, the quarterly headlines we run, it's ironic. You know, it, it is now, you do an earnings call in a, in a quarter, and the headlines all say, how did you do, not versus what you said you would do, how did you do versus where consensus ended yesterday? You missed or you beat. 
You didn't miss or beat anything other than where the analysts updated their models yesterday, usually having paid no attention. And so you just don't buy into it. And you know, uh, it's easy. It's not easy to do. And I, I don't have any great answers, but, but. Um, it's better than the alternative, because if you get hooked on that short-term drug, oh my God. Um, and, and uh, there's some examples right now of some cultures that were built in the valley, so tied to our valuation, so tied to how rich we'll be at IPO or after IPO, and, and it's just not sustainable. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I, I don't think there's a better choice. It will be fascinating to see the Dell story, right? Because yeah. Uh, as they go private and what they're able to do once they're outside of the, the public eye and they don't have to deal with a lot of the extra regulation and the, you know, I sit on a lot of public company boards and we talk less than I'd like us to about the strategy and the product and the business because so much of our time is consumed with regulatory things that we have to do now. Yeah. And so... I, I, I just think it'll be fascinating to see where that all goes. And I think I couldn't agree with John Moore about the fact that if you try to manage quarter by quarter, you're really going to screw it up, right? It, 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 you can pay attention to that, but you really have to make calls. You don't build great companies a quarter at a time. You build great companies by having a vision, doing tough things, making investments and calls that are unpopular that won't pay off. You did this at eBay on several things for, you know, for years. It's very hard to actually do something that in a quarter to turn something around that's going to have a, a fabulous result in a big global company in 90 days. Good luck with that. Thanks. All right, you finally get the... Yeah. Ask your question. Hi, Thanks uh, for being patient. My name is Murthy Nukala. I actually have a company based in Foster City, and we try to live a lot of the same values that you were talking about. But I actually wanted to ask you a different question. So I have three young kids at home, and when I think about my own life, I'm defined by a lot of the adversity I faced. But at home, I try to eliminate all adversity for my kids. And I think that's true of a lot of the parents here. So what advice do you have as parents? Because I think of being a parent is probably the most important job I have, but if I eliminate adversity for them, which is what made me, you know, how do you deal with that, that uh, trade-off? I, I, you know, that's a brilliant question. I can tell you that um, I was driven mostly by the fact that my dad died at seven, went right in front of me when I, when he, when I was seven years old, and he didn't have life insurance, so we went from a uh, pretty well-off family, not a rich family, but a well-off family to penniless overnight. And I swore I wouldn't do that. That I, First of all, I was stupid enough to think I was going to die at the same age. And when I hit that age, I was at eBay, and I was like, woohoo, I'm not dead. <laughs> what now what? But uh, secondly, secondly, um, I went to work really hard, and I always had life insurance early on, and then I made money. And then I freaked out and realized, oh my God, now I'm going to raise entitled. How do I keep my kids from being entitled? And if you got to know my wife, you know that she's fabulous and she kept the kids for years thinking that we had no money and that they were going to have to pay for their own college. She did things like, um, you know, she'd make them take lunch to high school. How uncool is that? But she, <laughs> so, so that they could save for college. And then as the eBay thing got more and more public, it got harder and harder to, to, <laughs> to, to hijack. Um, but she had them fooled for a long time. And I think I really, the advice I have for you is you want to have them in a bubble and be protected, but you don't want them not to be grounded. And so do things where you expose them, where they have to go do charities or take trips to really underprivileged places and show service. And, you know, our kids always went down to Mexico to build houses for some really poor areas and see what was up there. But you have to, you have to teach them that what they're seeing is not normal, right? Or the, and if they're advantaged because you're advantaged, that's awesome. 
but you have to show them another path. I, I, I think it's one of the toughest things we have to manage because we want it all to be right for them. But the value system that you have came from, from the adversity you have, same here. And it's, it, it's complex. I'd love to see you add on to that because I'm not you know, sure I answered I think that. it's a very personal, I mean, I, 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 felt, I felt the same way. It's like, oh my God, my kids are growing up in Silicon Valley. And, and my kids are a little older now, in the 90s and in the dot-com. You know, well, this is normal. Um, I'd say two things based on my personal experience. One, there's more than just economic adversity. And kind of life deals the other adversities equally, too. So I have four kids ages 18 to 28. And all four have had some kind of adversity of one way or another. They may not have had economic adversity as in they were penniless. But, you know, whether it can be something as simple as breaking up with a girlfriend or boyfriend to, to uh, health issues, to losing, being cut, being unpopular, whatever. So um, there's more than just one kind of adversity. And then the, the, the second thing I'd say in the economic adversity is I think the only thing we can do is just role model how we live. You know, and, and, and that, to some extent, then that becomes the norm. And, and each of us make different choices on that. But um, I, I, how many of you have kids in your 20s or 30s? I mean, right, I, I don't know about you. I'm finding my kids who thought I was idiots throughout my high school when they were teenagers. And, and you know, they, as they're getting a little older, you're, you're watching some of the values that I had hoped would come out. They're coming out. Um, and so you realize that, that I think just the values you role model end up mattering. So, but I worried. We, we, my wife and I talked about that constantly for many years. All right. How about we, we've been? We want this moment. to be balanced. To, there's the, the, the left side of the. I room, think the we right need one from the, the IBM. We team. need one from the IBM team. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I've been asked to stand because I'm five one. <laughs> <laughs> Not much more. So Erica Perez from IBM, and thank you very much for this opportunity. So I'd like to bubble this up from you know family building, company building, to if I can, nation building and country building. We're at a very unique crossroads as the US, and I'm just very interested in seeing your perspective on what are our opportunities and what do we need to do in the next three to five years to sustain our relevancy in the world, our competitiveness overall. So I'd like to kind of bubble that up to that level, please. I am very, uh, uh, take the first shot. And Go. I am very concerned about what we talked about with entitlement on here within employees and companies, within the same issue within the country. This is a country that was founded on working hard and being entrepreneurial and being scrappy and always being the best. And I want to make sure that we address our education system issues, that our kids are trained and grown to the best that we can. We've got to fix the STEM problem there. And then we have to be competitive. You know, uh, I think closing our borders and trying to make sure no one else can come in to compete with us is artificial. It's artificial in a company. It's artificial everywhere else. You have to be the best by being the best. And we have more resources and more capability than any country on the planet. And I would love to see us step that back up instead of saying, woe is me, and sliding into where some of our European you know, countries are. I would love to be back at the forefront. I, I think we're still at the forefront. I think we need to not accept it, that it's OK to go backwards. I don't think it's OK in our employees. I don't think it's OK in our country. So, but that's me. I, you know, I, I'm gonna, like so many things we're, we think alike. Number one, I'll say I've never been more frustrated by Washington and what I see. And you know, on one hand, I want to blame Washington. On the other hand, we've got to blame ourselves. Nice. If we're going to act like Tea Party, if we're, going to, if we're going to elect representatives, left or right, based on litmus test things, we get what we, we, get what we read. So Washington's very depressing to me right now. Um, on the other hand, I, think, I don't think I've ever been more optimistic about our country, perversely. Um, and, and because I think some of the core values and principles and the purpose of our company, or of our country rather, will be what enables us to be great over time, continue to be great over time. 
And then two practical things, women in STEM. You know, we need more women doing math and science. Certainly, as a technology company, we need more women engineers. And then the, the visa situation's nuts. We bring the world's most talented people in, educate them, and then we make them leave the country. And the diversity that comes by having them stay and the increased competitiveness that comes from having them stay is a healthy thing. So uh, those would be, if I had to, sort of two areas where I would push policymakers to, to make change, it'd be those two. All right, back. How would you see, um, I'm Jitu Patel, by the way, I work for EMC. Um, how would you see talent sourcing fundamentally changing over the next decade or so? Do you see that there's going to be a big shift in how talent is sourced as a new generation comes on board, as we get new people to come in and into the workforce, or do you think it's going to be the same way that it's always been? Well, I think this is, I'll, I'll, I'll start here, because then Maynard built a company on what I'm about to say. I think one of the most interesting trends that are coming on right now is this notion of, you can call it collaborative consumption, which is um, uh, Airbnb, Uber, TaskRabbit, He'll talk about live ops in a minute, where someone can sell their skills on their own terms and thus almost become their own business. It's, it's a really version, a little bit what Pierre started with eBay around it's goods. It's eBay for work. It's right? eBay for work. It's eBay for time. It's eBay for your skills. And, and it's, a, it's a, an enormously interesting and I think exciting and powerful concept. Describe what you did at live ops, which is a real, was, yeah, was well, leading edge. Well, what we did at live ops is we, uh, we enabled, our technology enabled people to work as though they were in a dedicated call center from their home, and they worked on whatever they wanted to. They chose what, what hours they wanted to work. They chose what companies they wanted to support and take calls from. And then the technology worked in such a way that if you were a good performer, you got the calls routed to you first. And if you were a poor performer, you didn't get so many or so much business. And of course, over the years, we've got a brand new capability called Engage that lets us do this in a big social mobile way that um, is different than, than anybody else because we think the customer conversation is happening all over the place today. But I would just say outsourcing, whether I, I think what's going to happen more is traditional outsourcing is low you know, low work or low cost work that gets offshore. I think that you're going to see a lot of people that are willing to do high impact, high value work on their terms and live wherever they want and work differently in a big way. Airbnb is a great example of that. There's this whole issue of idle assets, right? And that are getting deployed differently, which is what Airbnb is doing. I was at the Super Bowl on Sunday, a sad ending, but a fun game. Uh, <laughs> um, and I got extra tickets um, to the game. And we had no rooms left. I rented a place from somebody I didn't know that had never rented on Airbnb before. And we had a fabulous experience. They cooked us Louisiana breakfast every morning. And we had fun. That was economics that weren't going to be in New Orleans, because I would probably have had to rent something 100 50 miles away. So I think the concept of work and where work is done and by whom is going to dramatically change. And people can be way more entrepreneurial and create their own jobs way more in the future. But I think outsourcing, as we call it outsourcing today, will not look like I what it's. Outsourcing as much as acquisition of talent. Oh, acquisition. I think, I think the future of work is much more like what goes on in the movie industry where bands of talent come together to actually produce a movie and then disband and stay connected and in, in, you know, closely aligned. And when the next big project comes up, they get together. Um, I used to, I was telling John this earlier today, we had, when we had all the stuff we had to do to fix the infrastructure here at eBay, as that got fixed, some of the ops guys were like really sad. And I was like, what are you sad about? We've we solved this. And they're like, well, we're not heroes anymore. I'm like, okay, well, let's how about we make you heroes over the volume and the quietness that's going on. And you know, we go out and talk about what they're handling. But there's a piece of me that wonders, even if they were eBay employees, maybe I should have lent them out 
from time to time to somebody else that was having a real big issue to go solve it, right? We did take over um, a company one time that was our picture hosting company uh, because we didn't think we wanted to do the technology. And it turned out, this was in the early days, we didn't have pictures on the site or payments or anything else. So we outsourced pictures. Can you imagine a world today where you weren't looking at photos for eBay? And we outsourced that. And as we grew and we solved our scale problems, they always broke. And that was not that fun. So we just went over and took over their company and sent a team over until it was fixed. So I do think there's, there's the whole way work is being done, it, it will change a little bit without losing the values that we talked about with John. And what a nice way to round, right? We started with talent, the first thing we talked about tonight, the young talent, and, and we're ending with talent. So please join me in thanking Maynard for joining us tonight, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, John. For I'd like to thank you two very much for sharing your perspectives so candidly in this wide-ranging conversation. As a small token of our deep appreciation, we present you with the Churchill Club Speaker T-shirt. Please wear it in good health. Wait, is this out of date now? Yeah. Because we Should just be, had another conversation. No, just be about, well, yeah, that's, we're going right. to have to get Sorry. a new one tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks again to eBay for hosting us. I understand there are a few books left out in the lobby area, so if you'd like to purchase one, please do so. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time.